thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back to the Just Go Play podcast. I'm Matt Young. I'm filling in for Daryl Devinish, who's taking some vacation for the summer, which is exactly what he needs to be doing. Really happy to talk to a someone I really respect and I've respected for a long time. Humble servant leader, done great work in the coach education space, but just a great human being, uh, Wade Gilbert, Dr. Wade Gilbert from Fresno State University. Wade, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Really excited to have you. Can you start off by just giving the audience a little bit of a background of who you are and some of the things that you do and have done in and around the coach education space so they can get a sense of, of, of your history and your, and your skill set? Sure. No, thanks for having me on the show. It's always great to be a part of uh, any any project that you're you're leading, Matt, and um, all the great work that you've been doing, activating things. So uh, for me, I've always been passionate about um, quality sport experiences, I guess would be one way to kind of frame it. Uh, grew up in Canada playing sports, worked in the U.S. for the last 20 odd years in lots of different capacities. And I've been really blessed uh, to be able to see the, the sport experience from all different perspectives. So I have kids who are going through the youth sport experience. I'm a board member, vice president of a local sport club. I've coached multiple sports. I work at, with Olympic teams and pro teams and college teams. So, and I do research. I do research on this and I stay connected to leading scientists and uh, thought leaders around the world on um, coach development, coaching, quality sport experiences. So I really uh, feel that I have a holistic view of of the the picture um, by staying actively engaged in in all aspects of it. Yeah, and and that's one of the things I really wanted to highlight was that breadth of range of of experience that you have. So a lot of the times we hear. Uh, from academics and researchers about, hey, this is what should happen. And then when you when you try to implement that, you're like, okay, well, that's not really the real world constructs. There's so many other variables that uh, that that are at play here, but you actually have the opportunity to be in there. So I'm going to start off by asking you this, because you just got involved, really heavily involved in your kids' sport and at the board level, as you're as you're mentioning. What was the biggest surprise? that you saw when you actually got into that grassroots experience, uh, given your, your background mm. and, and your experience? Well, it, it doesn't surprise me now, but if I were to go back, let's say 15 years, um, I guess there was an assumption that um, because there's official logos and letterheads and, you know, whether it's Babe Ruth baseball or USA soccer or whatever it might, or Hockey Canada, okay well these are people who've obviously done a lot of research in this area and are familiar with uh kind of best practices and things like that um and then you really get into it and you realize how uh how much of a gap there is between what science and evidence across disciplines whether it's business or, or education or medicine or coaching um what we know can work and does work and then what is happening at the the ground level ground zero so to speak a local club and it was very frustrating at first for sure um but the more i've tried to be sensitive to the 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 local context so i've become convinced that the people running youth sport the average uh, person who's volunteering their time in many cases, they're not deliberately or intentionally trying to create these awful experiences for kids. They're doing the best they can in their, with the skills and the skill set that we've equipped them with, which in many cases is, is nothing or very, very minimal, right? A, a fingerprint and maybe an online module and, and off you go. Um, I know that's changing and we're trying to do a better job of that. And there are some bright lights across the sporting landscape where people like yourself are really investing in that. 
But that was uh, a big eye opener and kind of a call to action. Like there's, I have two choices here. I can shut up and drop my kid off and just leave it alone. Or I can jump into the fire and try and make a difference. And that's what I did. And it's messy. And anyone who's been involved in that knows because there's egos involved. There's money involved. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who make a living or try to make a living off of kids' sport. Uh, some do it well. Others don't. I, I mean, I, I'm, again, we're, this, this pandemic that we're in right now has really exposed that um, more. You see... Uh, even though there's all these restrictions and guidelines depending on where you live and what we're learning about the health situation, um, there's still sport, youth sport tournaments being held and organized and people making lots of money uh, off of kids. And so I, I think it did really uh, make me more sensitive and more aware to the, that huge gap between what it could be and what it is. Yeah, no kidding. So the you know the saying is the formula for success need not be reinvented; it need be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, just run us through, just uh, as a little bit of levity. So, so you come in. You're a very humble person, so it's not like you're flying in, going, "Do you know who I am?" But, but walk us through that process where you're engaging uh, with all your experience in coach education and with all these sport experiences, and uh, you know, walk us through that experience when you. Are sitting there and somebody is telling you something that you know is not in alignment with a quality sport experience how, how do you how did you manage that how did you how did you process that given your expertise and not just go like do you know what I do dude do you, do you know what I do for a living <laughs> there's definitely been a lot of interesting moments along the way I remember vividly one time coaching I think it was soccer kids soccer and I literally got off the plane from the global coaching conference being the keynote speaker in Finland. So the world's leaders on coaching, coach development, talking to the top people in the world, getting off a plane, going to a soccer practice and getting in an argument with a volunteer coach who's basically telling me, you don't know what the hell you're talking about and you're full of shit. It's like, those are moments where you wanna say, let me explain what I do for a living, okay? Before you, before you just want to jump back into, well, this is how we, this is how we run things around here, and how we've always done it. But I've also learned through, unfortunately, trial and error and lots of mistakes that, at the end of the day, it's 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 relationships and people skills. And you know that old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, is so true, right? And you you've lived in, you're successful in a lot of different endeavors, and it's the people skills. So I think. We have the information on what a good sport experience can look like or should look like, what a quality coach could look like and quality coaching could look like, but um, we don't necessarily have the skills to communicate that in a way that um, maybe disarms people because there is a lot of, um, uh, we're talking about your kid or kids, like they have a lot invested in this emotionally, financially. And so for some expert, really, you know, who are we? We have some distinctions and credits in some other world, <laughs> not in their world. Right. And so you come in and, and so I've learned to be, uh, take a longer view perspective on things, build coalitions, um, look for openings. Don't try and come in and change things really quickly. Try and get a better sense of, you know, there are obviously there's in many cases, there are things that are working in each of these contexts. So it's not, it's not uh, 360 changes, it, it's, it's tweaks and, and where are there moments and, and things that we can uh, look to improve. I'll give you an example. The other day we were, we're dealing with our, with our hockey board here in our hockey club, how to return to play and looks like in California, there won't be a season at least until maybe January but we want kids to still have opportunities to, to train and play and be with their friends and whatnot, but do it in a safe way. So as much as possible, I, even though I may know the information or I, in some cases I wrote the information. So there's people on the board or parents saying, well, no, that's not true. This is the way you got to do it or you can't do that. I, I know otherwise, but if it just comes out of Wade's mouth, it doesn't really mean much. So what I try and do is I'll go to USA Hockey, I'll go to my colleagues, people I work with, say, hey, can you write an email responding to this, this 
question or this concern. So now it's coming from USA Hockey or from you know the IOC or somebody else, an official recognized organization. It's not coming from Wade. Right. Even though I may have been the one who wrote that for that group, <laughs> but yeah. Right. Super smart. And 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 we always talk about multiple points of contact. So you know, it takes between six and 20 points of contact to make a sale. What are we selling? We're selling quality sport. And you're right. For a lot of the listeners out there who are as frustrated as you are, who may have um, a slightly elevated knowledge or acumen on what should be happening, it's super frustrating. Um, they go in, I went in, bull in a China shop. We got to change this. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I, I can attest to that. I, I keep trying to do that, but it doesn't work. Um, you know, for, so so what it, what it, you know, and we talked to Mike O'Donnell, uh, Senior Director of Player Development for the PGA of America, and it was interesting to listen to him in this context because they actually have their team go through change management and behavior change courses. So they have to get certified or, or educated in these courses because of that behavior change, um, you know, and it takes a long time. You know, it, it's kind of too bad that we have to do all that work um, because we're actually trying to deliver a positive sport experience to a kid. It seems bizarre, um, but you're, you're right. It is the world that we live in. So what do you tell parents or, or anyone for that matter, who, who wants to do the same things that you, who wants to bring in change? I mean, okay, you got to be patient. We know that. So is what you're saying, and I just want to repeat it, is what you're saying, you know, try to get the outside sources, try to, you know, introduce multiple points of contact to that support what the message is that you're trying to give, try to access different um, things like USA hockey. To, that this is, this is the official because it seems to be, and that's why we have people like you and Gene Smith talking about, these are the kind of athletes we're looking for at the Ohio state university, because we want parents to hear that this is a top power five college. It's not just about the, the physical competence. They, they look for the character. They, they look for leaders. They don't want to be kind of just like everybody else and have this be a transaction. They want successful student athletes that can then finish their careers as many will and go on to be, you know, successful in other jobs. So that's really what we're trying to do. How do you, is there any other way? Is it, is it, it does it get easier? I guess is my question. Is there any easier fast track way uh, for the people out there that are going, hey, listen, I'm frustrated. If this guy's frustrated and look what he does, how do I even stand a chance? Because that's what we see, parents pack it in. And then that's what kind of is the catalyst to, I'm out of here, I'm going over there. They've got better coaching. Well, do they? Well, it's more expensive, so they must. Well, but do they really? Uh, you know, and then, and, then, and then it's just a, you know, you know how it goes. It's just a, a, a incipient spin to the bottom. What do, you what do we say to people? How do we educate people? Wow, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, I, I think you have to ask yourself how how much are you willing to invest in this effort? So, because it is effort and it is work, constant work, constant work. So, um, if it bothers you enough, get involved. Ask to sit on the board. Ask to be a team manager. Ask to volunteer. Uh, in some capacity. So, so get involved. So you can go home and complain about it, or you can try and be a difference maker. Right. And then once you are inside, listen. So take some time to ask people why things are done the way they're done. Why, why do we do it that way? Has anybody ever thought of it this way, as opposed to coming in trying to change things right away? Right. If it's important enough to you, there's always a need for people to serve and to contribute. And if you're thinking, well, I'm already there anyways, I'm dropping my kid off at the gym or the pool or whatever it is, and then I'm sitting there on my phone for an hour while they're practicing, you know, maybe I, I use that time to get involved in some capacity. Because it's you, you're trying to build social capital too. Right. So you're trying to show people in that community that you number one you care number two you have something to offer um and you're worth listening to in a sense right and it is what i have found still exists and is really challenging is um you know if if you didn't play at a high level in that sport you're 
right off the bat, you're at a disadvantage in terms of social capital. Right. So, you know, if, if you played one game in the NHL, people are going to listen to you. Right. You know, versus regardless of what else you do, you're a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah, that's nice. You never played. Um, so there's always, there's still that very much I've noticed in, in all the sports um, that the, the playing experience or the athletic experience is valued more than, than any other type of experience. Um, so yeah, I'd say get involved, um, ask lots of questions, listen, and then try and uh, kind of gently, it's always a compromise. So try and feed information as much as possible. What I found actually to, to work to diffuse, because people get emotional. So anytime there's a decision about anything, money, kids, whatnot, people get emotional and they focus on emotion first and feeling and gut reaction. So I always try and infuse the conversations with uh, outside resources, not research articles, just, okay, this is a great conversation. Here's a link to, um, you know, a, a half page little article from, on this very topic from Project Play from the IOC, from the USOPC, from USA Hockey, from the CDC, from our local county. Uh, because it, what I've found is in many of these conversations, they're not informed conversations. Right. They're gut reactions, they're feelings, emotional. So I, as much as possible, I will bring in, I'll, I'll bring in um, evidence Say, okay, great conversation. I hear what you're saying, but here's something we should consider. And then, so you're, you're, you're kind of gently trying to educate them and it's not me telling them it's, Hey, you know, here's some resources. Cause I'll give you an example. We had uh, a coaches meeting the other day and one of the coaches we were talking about, you know, we're trying to make decisions about programming for the fall and what's safe and what's not safe. And, I shared some data that I had read just from the head of uh, a local hospital because a former mayor who's very famous, he was uh, a Hollywood actor, he came into town and is pushing an agenda and the head, of, basically spewing a bunch of opinions, the head of the regional hospital wrote a rebuttal to that that was published saying, hear the facts okay yeah. and and so we're having this coaches meeting and we're talking about programming and one of the coaches i shared one of the facts i had read from that report one of the coaches, oh that's baloney and my buddy works at the hospital and that's that i said okay i'm going to send you the press release right now with the facts okay so i sent it to the whole group and it was just one page right and he read through it and you know, he's mature enough to go, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's be informed when we're having the conversations as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And leadership is something that we've heard time and time again. I wrote down a couple points here. And your point about emotion is really good uh, because it's about disarming people. It's about engaging people. It's about pulling people into that behavior change process versus pushing stuff on people. That never tends to work and never tends to be as effective. And it's a really good point for all of our listeners whether you're a parent, whether you're a coach, whether you're an athlete, administrator, whoever you are, um, really, you know, change. Everyone wants change. Nobody wants to change. Um, everyone loves the notion of accountability until it's their guy or gal. Um, so that's, those are really the forces at play in, in the behavior change process. Um, so that's, that's really good information, and thank you for that. Well, how, how do you think, and, and, I, and I mean, this is a wide open question. I'm not trying to nail you down to the answer because it's a silver buckshot solution. How do you think we can get better at having these discussions faster? And when I asked that question, Wade, is there a way that we can start preparing and training people while they're athletes? Is there a way we can start training and preparing people before they arrive at their community association in terms of leadership skills or, or have them have to go through a curriculum or a course before they step into an administrative role uh, so they can have some of that reflection so they can be informed so they can have that knowledge. You've written so many great uh, frameworks, quality coaching frameworks for the USOPC. Your book coaching better every season is basically a step-by-step -step guide for whoever actually wants to read it and then 
take that information and do it. You've, you've done it for people. Like this is how you do it. Um, do we, is, are we missing a stick is, is my question. We've got the carrot, um, you know, it, it, here's, here's what you can do. You know, you can get accredited, you can get your certification, you can rise up the ranks. So we've got the carrots, but do we, do we need a stick and who, whose responsibility would that stick be if we did need one is my question. Well, uh, yes, I agree that we do need a stick uh, because we're lazy by nature and that's not being critical of, <laughs> of anyone. We're, we're designed to seek out stable states and homeostasis and that's true in any aspect of our life where we don't generally seek out extra efforts right. and things that are going to cost more time and energy. So other and we you and I have had this conversation many times you know the difference between a nice to have and a and a and a mandatory must do so all these things we create and say geez it'd be great if they read this and it'd be great if they did this and they're not going to do it um just that's the reality of, of our world I think so we require in many in most sports um you can't go out and coach unless you get your certification whatever that may look like i mean i just did my level three ice hockey certification here in the u.s and it was like i think eight hours and it was zoom virtual calls and whatnot um so there's a lot of people on those calls you can tell who don't want to be there right but you're not allowed on the ice until you do this so you got to do it. Okay. Now we could argue, well, why don't we have something similar in place for board members, for team managers, right. for, you know, we have safe sport requirements here and in, in Canada and in most places now. So we do have sticks in place already. Um, and that's why I'm kind of wondering if, so the model is there. So we could have a stick, for a sport parent, <laughs> you don't just write a check and drop your kid off. If you want your kid to be part of our club, there's a one hour meeting you got to attend. Yeah. A, a parent or a guardian, someone in the family has to attend. And we do have team meetings and things like that. But um, so I think having mandated um, sticks, as you call them, are, are effective in raising maybe not necessarily a direct correlation between that and behavior change, but definitely in raising awareness right. is a step, right? Uh, changing the conversations, uh, creating that language that we want uh, for our, our sport communities. So I, I think those are things that we already have in place a little bit and, and we could do better. And one thing that's come up many times in different environments I've been in is, we call it, uh, somebody called it the power of the permit. You know, so where, where are the, the municipal governments and the communities right. in these um, in these efforts. So you want to rent out the rink, the pool, the gym, wherever it is, um, from the school district or the community. You should have. We could make it mandatory, just like you have to show you have insurance. We're not going to allow you to use this facility unless you have insurance. Right. Well, we're not going to allow you to use this facility unless. Um, you know, coach, team manager, board director, whatever, has taken this um, one hour online training and how to be a good sport parent or whatever it might be. Right. I mean, and you know, you've created a lot of these things. There's a lot of tools that are out there. So it's not about recreating the wheel. It's just um, finding creative ways to, to make sure people see that. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I'm with you. I, I really, I really yeah. like that idea because money. At the end of the, at the end of the day, people respond to money. So you know, we can do all the well-intentioned stuff that we want. Hey, here are all these resources. It's fantastic. Nah, I don't need it. I got it. I played. I did this. I know that. Um, but I agree with you in that if we got to a state where the insurance and, and and because if you look at the insurance, you know, where are the payouts? Payouts are on the back end of the stuff that we brush under the carpet and we ignore to the tune of you know, Michigan State half a billion dollars. So, you know, if we had those mechanisms in place on the front end and we were able to hold people to a higher level of accountability, um, and like you said, it doesn't need to be a week-long, eight-hour-a-day process. It needs to be a, hey, do you understand 
what kids value. Do you understand that this is a service-based business? Here are some tips to, you know, and strategies that you can use. Here are some resources, here are some links. But actually, like you talked about, a lot of people don't know what they don't know. Um, so, and we've worked with a lot of parents and people say, oh, the parents are crazy, the parents are crazy. And, I, and my argument always is, yeah, you're, you're gonna have that element of crazy all the time. However, in my experience, in our experience, the more we've actually sat down and pulled the parents in and stopped treating them in that intellectual silo and, and made them engage them a part of the process, the more we have said, you know, you want to volunteer? Okay, what is your skill set? Because if your skill set is accounting, I'm not going to put you in 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 charge of tournaments. Uh, you know, it, I'm going to put I'm going to put the person who's the, the social butterfly and has all the connections and loves to be in the community, they're going to be in charge of tournaments. You're going to be in charge of accounting. And I'm not going to sit in the AGM and wait for you to raise your hand and see who has the strongest heartbeat. I'm actually going to be intentional and go into my community and start having conversations. Like you said, people, 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 I'm going to find, Hey, this is Wade Gilbert. Hey, Wade, can you come in and give us some expertise and lend some expertise in coach education? Hey, here's somebody else. Hey, can you take on this aspect? Because it's the busy people who you engage that tend to get shit done in a hurry um, where the other people kind of waffle and struggle. So uh, I really like, I really like that, you know, being deliberate and finding the people. I really like the idea and the notion of making sure that they are educated and that's not optional um, because anything, you know, anything in the absence of accountability is an option. So making sure that there's accountability around that. And I really like what you said about somehow tying that to the ability to turn the lights on. So if you, are, if you are not in compliance with this, you can't do this. And I think it's strange that, you know, if you want to babysit, you got to take a babysitting course. You have, mm-hmm. it, you, there is no, there is nothing, you know, there's no argument. Everyone does it. Here you go. Take the course. My son or daughter is in the course. Yeah, this is fantastic. And then they're allowed to babysit and, and make revenue. Mm-hmm. That's on babysitting. So when you look at the, the, the level of responsibility for a coach, at any level and, and just to say, Hey, well, you know, and when we, when we, the, usually it, the emphasis is on the technical, tactical and physical. Okay. So this is what you're going to do. This is how you run your practices, what you do, but we leave out, you know, this is how you set a vision and, and a mission and a culture. This is how to create that culture. This is how to invite parents into that culture. This is how to make sure your young athletes, the young men and women are adhering to that culture. Um, you know, this is how you develop character. This is how we, really elevate connection in, in this whole thing. We, we seem to miss that. So it seems to be a gap between, you know, Nike and, and, and USOPC's five minute, here's how you coach a kid and Wade Gilbert's Bible on quality coaching. There seems to be a massive gap in between that, um, particularly for the competence, confidence, character and connection pieces, which as we know are what 98, arguably a hundred percent of a lot of these young women, men and women need and will need as they go forward so um you know interesting now i'm I'm just rambling on here but but you gave me just triggered another thought one thing that and we haven't done it very successfully but the principle i think is very powerful um within a club within an organize a youth sport organization there needs to be someone ideally there, there should be a position for um whether you call it director of coaching or coach development or coach lead or whatever, uh, someone who can tie all the coaches together. So you go across your U8, U10, U12, U14, high school, whatever. Um, because otherwise they're just a bunch of independent contractors. Yes. Give them a stipend. Uh, they're there probably because their kids on the team and everybody does their own thing. And, if you can have some, and you can, because we've done it, and I know there's examples of it, um, where you have someone on in your organization who serves, maybe it's a board member, or maybe it's even a paid position. Give them, you know, an extra two grand, three grand, something. So it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but as soon as you put a little bit of money on it, now there's responsibility and accountability. Right. And also pride. Like, I'm getting paid to do this. I should put a little bit more effort into it. It matters. Um, and that person then is the glue. It's like a team leader, right? A team captain, whatever you want to, it's the same thing. Your, your coaches across your club are a team. They should be, 
They should be a team. Right. But if there's no leader, if there's no captain, then there, it's like a house full of kids without a, a parent, right? Right. So there needs to be a parent in the room saying, you know what, we're meeting every Friday and we're going to talk about, pro you know, whatever, just simple things. It doesn't have to be super formal, but there's a regular connection amongst those coaches where they see each other, they talk to each other because it's breaking down those, those kind of invisible barriers. So you're coaching the eight year olds and I'm coaching the 12 year olds. And when I get them, all I'm doing is complaining, ah, oh, Matt, they don't even, all this stuff I got to reteach Matt, Matt never taught it. Right. But I don't ever talk to Matt. I have no relationship with Matt. I just bash Matt. <laughs> okay. So now we're getting together and we talk about player progression and we talk about, you know, our favorite warm ups and should kids stretch before practice and things like that. And just stuff that every coach deals with. But now we talk about it as a club and we, it's more, we humanize each other. Right. And we have, we can have a shared vision and we can collaborate resources and, and just, uh, for example, if you look across a club, you will have expertise in every area. You'll have people who are great with goaltending, offense, defense, you know, pick your sport, right? And, but individually, no one coach would be an expert in any of those things. Right. So I think the whole, the whole team approach but you need a leader, you need leadership to do that. You need a role, whether that again, is a formal position on the board, like, you know, director of coaching or coach development or whatever you want to call it. That, that to me should be part of the, the operating procedure. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And, and two things that I've written down here, isn't it interesting that you and I are sitting here talking about how to create a team for youth sports and team sports. Yeah, uh, you were so good at espousing all this information and telling kids, "Hey, you got to do this. You got to communicate. You got to be totally, yeah. everyone on board." But yeah. we don't do it at the administrative level, and yeah. even at the higher levels of sport, we only focus on our role, our yeah. sport, our thing. And uh, it's it's interesting the irony of that. Well, so, and just to piggyback on that, every time I've tried things like that, whether it's here at Fresno State doing bringing all our coaches together, or school district, or the club that I'm now a board member of. Every time we do things like that, the resounding why haven't uh, we done this before? Yeah, response is that was amazing. We haven't, we've never done that. It was so great to talk to so and so, and we never talked to each other. It's just creating a shared space for people to have conversations around things that matter for our kids and our club, right? But like you said, it took you and it takes a leader to do that and pull people together and galvanize that. You know, Gene Smith talked about that because he talked about the fact that he pulls all of his coaches in at the Ohio State University and basically they have that exact thing. And then they also do it at the athlete level. They have a leadership mm -hmm. forum uh, where they, they work with athletes on every team to create a leadership group to then lead that team so that you don't have the coach versus the athlete dynamic. There, it's actually a team dynamic. And I remember yeah. when, I was, uh, when I was there, you know, I said, where did this come from? And they said, a lot of it was from the military because the military is very good at units. And this is how you have to, because if you don't, you're dead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so really that's a, that's the most dire consequence. If you aren't in sync with your entire team, the consequences are literally life and death. So, um, you know, they had the military come in and, and actually work with the coaches to then develop the units. And you hear that all the time, especially in large sports like football units, we're going to be our, our linebacking unit, our offensive and line, defensive line unit, our, our receiving unit, and then how do those units all coalesce together? So I really like what you said um, about that. And I want to take it one step further because, you know, you talked about having a coach developer that oversees the development of all coaches. One of the things that we suggested to one of the organizations we were working with is actually having a, a lead for every stakeholder group. So you actually had an athlete, an athlete representative. You actually had a parent representative and yeah, and, a, yeah. and an official's representative, a coach's representative and an administrative representative and they meet. So that really takes care of all the stakeholders. If you break it down in youth sports, just like the football team, now you've got all the stakeholder groups and each one of them is reporting. It can, even if they only met once a month, what's going on, what's happening. Here's a shared communication. What are you hearing here? How can we get better there? Just again, and I want to take it all the way back to the beginning of this conversation. You brought up some really good points. People, 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 
it's all about the communication and and the better we are at listening and then and then learning and then sharing obviously the the better the the shared outcome is going to be so um, I really like that uh, your your idea of at minimum a coach educator and and the best case scenario is actually having that that captain for every single stakeholder group in your association uh, that's super powerful. I agree. Uh, having a lead, you know, a lead for each of those uh, stakeholder groups, and that you got to walk the talk, right? Just like you said, coaches have every coach, regardless of experience or certification they they understand and they they try to teach in my experience team teammanship right how, how we operate as a team and protect and support your teammates and communicate you have something to say tell them and yet we don't do that for ourselves it's unbelievable so it, it's a, that one to me is an, an easy win like you wouldn't have to convince people of the value of regular communication and having shared vision. If they, anybody ever questioned, I said, well, what do you talk to your team about? Right. Talk to your team about that all the time. So we're a team that, that to me is an important, uh, an easy win that comes to the language again, like the language of the sport community. When, when you're part of a club, it's, we are a team. You're not signing, you know, it's not the U8 team and the U10 team. It's, it's the Fresno Junior Hockey team. Right. We're a team. Right. Okay. And, and so I, I've seen evolution in that respect when I've been around groups. It takes time and you've got to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. But um, put protocols in place and put people in place. And we're redesigning our positions. You know, it's been a couple of years. We started to implement some of these, creating these positions. Right. You, you know, it's it plan to check out. So let's try it. We say, Ooh, that wasn't the right person for that position. Or we put too much on that person's plate and it actually should be two positions, one for this, one for that. Right. So, so you're always, always ebbing and flowing, but you know, you've said it, it you know, you gave your example at, at Fresno state when you brought everyone together and everyone's like, Oh my God, we should have done this earlier. Uh, I know we've heard it from, you know, we heard it from the PGA, you know, hockey USA. We heard it from the Ohio state university, pretty much every single group we've talked to, we talked to Barb, Barb Lyons, who uh, worked in Ontario in the ministry for 20 years of sport and then just got out of it because that just wasn't happening. They just didn't, they couldn't do that. And then she went out and works with a group of 15 PSOs and, and I've, I've witnessed it and she's fantastic. She basically, they meet once a month. Uh, if you don't follow the rules and procedures and you don't participate, you're out of the group. They share all of the policies, procedures, everything and and it's and these they have a they've broken down into an executive director group they've broken down into a technical director group, and they've broken down into a social media and communications group so she runs all of those groups and just really is the conduit to them communicating and coming together so we hear it all the time i guess it's just a matter of the willingness and, and readiness of an organization to do it and one of the things i know you're a big proponent of is don't try to boil the ocean you know this is not coming out of listening to this this information and saying, okay, tomorrow I'm going to my association and we're doing it all. It can happen in your team. It can happen in your division. It can happen in one sport. It can happen in, in, in one community at a time. It doesn't need to be this big wholesale, like you said, um, sweeping regulation and we're coming in. Well, with a hammer. yeah. And, and across leagues, like outside of your club, right? So sport, uh, same sport connections. Right. One thing we were doing uh, before it actually was scheduled to happen, before the world turned upside down, we were going to have in our school district, 80,000 kids, 23 different sports, you know, hundreds and hundreds of coaches. We were going to have um, within our district, we were going to, we already, we had it scheduled. We were going to bring them all to the school one evening, have uh, all the, co all the head coaches across all the sports. And then after 20 minute, kind of shared introduction they were all going to go into same sport rooms so all the football coaches in in the district are going to room 12 right and there was going to be a lead in that room the only time those let's say 10 12 head coaches who compete try to beat each other every friday night the only time they would ever talk to each other is at a at a league meeting 
that's mandated uh, once in a while to look at schedules, playoff seedings, right. you know, complain about referees, that kind of stuff. So they, the idea, that's an even bigger one team. Yes, you're all in a league trying to win a league, but we're all in the same school district. We're right. all one team. So let's make space in our schedule and it'll be facilitated for us to share best practices oh, about yeah. how we coach kids and how we coach football. And yes, there's always that little bit of hesitation. Well, why would I share? That's, that's proprietary. Why would it's I share awesome. my coaching <laughs> secrets with the guy I'm going to try and beat on Friday? And my job depends on my win-loss record. So, so there's some validity to that. But helping them understand that the whole ship rises. Okay, <laughs> Everybody's going to get better here. The games will be better. The kids will be better. You'll feel better. You'll enjoy coaching more. You'll have a bigger network. You'll feel more supported. So there's things like that 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 don't take really. You don't need a bunch of money. You just need to invest time in it. So right. people say, "Oh, we don't have time for it." Well, how many times do you practice a week? How many times are you out at football? Well. You know, we're in the weight room five times, we're on the field five times, two hours a shot, we got games, got so like 20 hours a week. And you're telling me you can't afford one hour? So let's not add an hour to your 20. Let's drop your 20 to 18 every second week or once a month. And we'll use that two hours for this instead. Right. It totally can be done. Yeah. No cost. <laughs> and it's really, you're talking about the abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset. Um, that we so often cling to. Um, and I agree, if you look at the community setting and the example that you gave, you know, the idea is to raise the entire level of the community. It, it's to make the entire community better. As these young men and women, you know, go on from our community, um, they're representing our community. And so the whole, the whole thing just gets that much better. So I, I totally agree with you. And, but, but again, that's, that's a big sell because again, you're, it's the abundance mindset. It's the more mindset. We'll all be better. Um, no, we'll wait, hang on a second. What about me? Um, so I really like that. Okay, wait, I, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you so much for um, sharing some of your insights. We really wanted to start, start the conversation talking about, um, you know, the difference between kind of the academia and research aspect to holy smokes, it's here. We've, we've gone through a few things. You've given a few great pointers. We always like to leave listeners with first steps. So what can we do? And you've given a lot already, but if you had to distill it down to one to three first steps, what can we do to increase the quality sport experiences in our own circle of, of influence? Well, number one is, is get involved. And I would say, ask your local sport club or organization um, how they operate. You know, what does the board composition look like? How do you get involved in the board? What opportunities are there to volunteer, to serve? Can I attend a board meeting? Should be open, many right. of them, right? Can I, can I sit in and, and get a better? So, so educate yourself. That would right. be step one. Right. Find out what is happening. Learn a little bit about the history of the club and the organization because that's what I find happens a lot. We come in, we're just passing through all these organizations, everyone's involvement is transit, transient. Right. We're passing through, usually with our kids. So it's like a bus stop, right? A bus station or a train station, people just passing through. Right. Nobody really lives at the bus station or stays there for 20 years right. occasionally, but most people are, are coming through with their luggage until their train leaves, right? So we're there and we think, we, we have all these questions, well, why do you do it that way? And why, that doesn't make sense. If you start asking questions and educate yourself on it and talking to board members or people who are involved at the moment, then you start to get the history behind it. So, oh, okay, that makes sense. I had no idea. All right. So before you try and intervene, educate yourself. Right. And then you're in a, not only are you in a better position to, to help serve, uh, but you also now have some social capital because people really – have, you know, have started to see this person's actually asking good questions and right. is interested in what we're doing. Right. As opposed to telling us what we, what we're doing wrong, what we should do. Right. So that'd be an easy one. I'd say to, to start. And then part of educating yourself is getting outside of your club and your organization and everything's online, you know, Google it. Right. I mean, number one, I'd say go to trusted source 
a trusted source. So what's a trusted source? Well, look, for whatever sport that you're, you're talking about, go to the top. So go to Hockey Canada, USA Football, whatever it might be, go there, and then it'll trickle down from there. So find out what's available in provincial, state, local, but go in and read what they, because this is, these organizations, many of them have lots of great information that people never see. Right. And geez, I had no idea. Did you realize they have a blog? And did you realize they have a newsletter? And did you realize there's a podcast, a free podcast on this? So go educate yourself first. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, perfect. We're leaving it there. We don't need too many. Uh, Wade Gilbert, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much, even more importantly, for your work and your continued work in this space to try to get out, elevating sport experiences. Um, you're a professor. You are churning out, uh, you know, future leaders. And, and those, that, that is awesome. It's just fantastic. I, would, I wish I could take your course. Um, but thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you for joining us today. If you like this podcast, share it. If people can find value of it, that's what it's all about. Um, Dr. Wade Gilbert, Coaching Better Every Season. Highly recommend that book. One of the best resources I've read. It's not just applicable to sport. It's actually applicable to life. It's applicable to business. It's applicable to your own personal and professional development. So thanks so much, Wade. And we'll look forward to catching up with you later. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Matt.